Standard Habby ain't too shabby. Just like Robbie Burns, you can write in it too. Yay! Hey there guys, I am Dr. Katie Yales from I'm Lab Productions, and in today's workshop I'm going to teach you how to write poetry in Standard Habby. This is a traditional Scottish stanza structure famously used by Robert Burns and also known as the Burns stanza. Standard Habby is often used for irreverent comic work, so bring your wit alongside your pencil. In this workshop, I'll introduce you to Standard Habby, briefly review its history, and go over its structure and common themes. Then I will lead you step by step through the process of writing poetry in Standard Habby yourself, giving you plenty of guidance along the way. Like most of the workshops in our Return to Form series, there are two different ways that you can watch this video. The first way is to take the workshop and write along. In this case, whenever you see a screen with a step on it, like this, pause at the step, do whatever the step says, do some writing, and then when you're ready to continue with the workshop, hit play again. The second approach is just to watch this video all the way through without pausing to get a good feel for how Standard Habby works, and then try to write a poem later in your own time. Just do whatever feels best for you. All that you need for this workshop is something to write with and something to write on. So pen or pencil and paper, a computer, tablet, your phone, really whatever you're most comfortable with. As usual with poetic forms in meter, I personally find it easier to compose them using pencil and paper, and that's how I'm going to be showing you in my examples, but it is totally fine to use digital devices. The most important thing is that you're doing what feels best for you. This workshop and our entire Return to Form series were made possible through the support of the National Lottery through Creative Scotland, so huge thanks to them. You can watch all of the videos in the project through the playlist linked up there in the eye. All right, guys, let's go for it. First things first, what is Standard Habby? Standard Habby is a roughly 400-year-old poetic form most famous for its use in Scottish poetry. The term Standard Habby describes a specific stanza structure with rules for rhyme and meter. Standard Habby stanzas are six lines long, so we call them sestets. The stanzas use the rhyme scheme A-A-A-B-A-B. In terms of meter, lines 1, 2, 3, and 5 are in iambic tetrameter, whereas lines 4 and 6 are in iambic dimeter. Finally, like several of the other poetic forms we've featured this season, standard habi is an open form. A poem written in standard habi can be however short or however long the poet wishes. Two stanzas to 102 stanzas. As long as every stanza is a sestet using that particular rhyme scheme and meter, you can add, delete, or rearrange stanzas to your heart's content. To briefly dip into the history of standard habi, Although you can find examples of poetry written in more or less this structure from the Middle Ages, the first significant poem that we recognize today to be written in Standard Habby was written in Scotland roughly 400 years ago. Around 1640, the Scottish poet Robert Sempill the Younger wrote a lament for a piper called Habby Simpson using this poetic form. In the 1700s, other Scottish poets noticed the form of this poem, really liked it, and started using it in their own work, and these poets included Robert Ferguson, Alan Ramsey, and many, many others. Alan Ramsey was the one who named this poetic form Standard Habby, after the piper lamented in Sempill's original poem, Habby Simpson. In the late 1700s, Robert Burns burst onto the scene and used Standard Habby with vim and vigor. Around 50 of his many poems are written in Standard Habby. These include many of his most famous poems, including To a Mouse, To a Louse, Holy Willie's Prayer, and the annual Burns Supper classic, Address to a Haggis. Today, Standard Habby is often known as the Burns stanza because Burns was the most famous poet to use it and because he used it so often. But yeah, it was already quite popular before Burns was even born. The more you know. And guys, although this is a traditional poetic form, poets do still use it today. 
Of course, we commissioned two brand new poems in Standard Habby for this season of Return to Form, which I'm going to talk about in a sec, but there are also several fantastic pieces in Standard Habby in this wonderful book, Addressing the Bard, 12 Contemporary Poets Respond to Robert Burns. I have linked to where you can find this book and also linked directly to one of the great poems inside of it, A Burl for Burns by Seamus Heaney, in the description below. Hokie dokie, so how exactly does standard habi work? There are a couple of different elements to juggle. So you've got the stanza structure, the rhyme scheme, the meter, and some of the traditional themes discussed in standard habi. Let's begin by going over the structure, and I will break it down for you using one of the wonderful commissioned pieces that I just mentioned. The brilliant Mark Grist and Angie Strachan wrote tremendous new poems in Standard Habby for us. They are irreverent and hilarious, and you can check out their performances through the video linked up there in the eye. Here, let's check out the first stanza of Angie Strachan's fantastic poem, Tooth Fairy Elegy. So first, you can see that this is a sestet. Like every other stanza in Standard Habby, it is six lines long. Secondly, let's check out the rhyme scheme. So if we use letters to count it out, it goes A, 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 B, A, B. Here, respect, yet, collect, and direct are the A rhymes, and children and condition are the B rhymes. Katie! I hear you yelling. Those aren't perfect rhymes! Yes! I enthusiastically answer. Some of them are half rhymes, also known as near or slant rhymes. If you're unfamiliar with half rhymes and the principles behind them, do check out my Form Fundamentals video on rhyme because I break it all down there. Using half rhymes is totally groovy in Standard Habby. Burns and the other poets famed for this structure used half rhyme constantly. And particularly in comedic Standard Habby pieces, like many of them are, using exaggerated half rhymes can actually add to the humor, so it's something that I'd encourage you to play with. Using half rhymes also makes writing in standard habi much, much easier. In every stanza, you need to use the same rhyming sound four times, that's the A rhyme, and a different rhyming sound twice for the B rhyme. So if you allow yourself to use half rhymes, you massively expand your options there. Okay, back to Angie's poem. So, as I noted before, standard habi is an open form. It can include as many stanzas as you would like. And every stanza is sort of a contained unit in itself. So when it comes to continuing down the poem, you don't carry forward those rhyming sounds to the next stanza. The next stanza will introduce its own rhymes. So here, in Angie's poem, you can think of the rhyme scheme for that second stanza as C, 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 D, C, D, because it uses different rhyming sounds from the A and B rhymes of the first stanza. However, because standard habi is an open form, so we just define it by the individual stanza, usually we just refer to the rhyme scheme as A, 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 B, A, B for every stanza in the poem to keep it simple. That's how I'm going to refer to the rhyme scheme for the rest of today's workshop, but just so that you are clear, the A and B rhymes of one stanza will probably be different from the A and B rhymes of a different stanza. They do not carry through stanza to stanza. Okie doke, moving on to meter. So you may have noticed that the lines with the B rhymes are shorter than the lines with the A rhymes. This is because, very helpfully, all of the A rhyme lines have one meter, one length, and all of the B rhyme lines have a different meter, a different length. Let's just focus on the first stanza again, and guys, I'm going to go over the meter of Standard Habby pretty quickly here, but if you want a comprehensive guide on how to identify and write in poetic meter, do check out my Form Fundamentals video, which is linked up there in the eye. When we say the first line aloud, we're here, today, to show, respect, we can tell that it's iambic tetrameter. I'll briefly break that down here. So I've marked the unstressed syllables here with an open circle, and the stressed syllables with a closed circle. 
This poem is structured in iams, which are sets of two syllables where the first is unstressed and the second is stressed. That means that the meter is iambic. There are four iams per line, so we call the meter tetrameter. That's how you get iambic tetrameter. Singing out the rhythm of iambic tetrameter sounds like this. T-tum, 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 T-tum. We're here today to show respect. Lines two, three, and five are exactly the same. They're in iambic tetrameter. Then lines four and six are shorter. If we count them out, there are two stressed syllables per line. From sleeping children, so the stresses on sleep and chill, and in mint condition, so the stress on mint and dish. Because each line has two stresses and follows an iambic pattern, we call this iambic dimeter. Whoa, 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 Katie, slow down. Those lines aren't just two iams. There's a random little unstressed syllable tacked onto the end of each of them. What's up with that? Chill out, my eagle-eyed friend. I got you. So yes, if these lines were in normal iambic dimeter, they would end on a stressed syllable. So t-tum, t-tum. From sleeping chill, or in mint condish. However, broadly speaking, when you're writing lines in meter that normally end in a stressed syllable, like iambic meter, you can, if you want to, add on an extra unstressed syllable to the end of the line. This is known as a weak ending. It used to be called a feminine ending, but we are not here for ingrained literary sexism that equates femininity to being weak. No siree. So that is what is happening here. In Angie's first stanza, the B lines are in iambic dimeter with a weak ending, meaning that they are both five syllables long. This is a practice that was really common in Standard Habby in Burns's day and in the form today as well. Often poets varied using weak endings with normal endings in this meter. The key rule to follow here is just to be consistent with how the meter works in the matching lines. So if one of your B lines has a weak ending, the other B line in the stanza has to have a weak ending too. It's okay for your A and B lines to differ here though for one set to be normal and the other weak, like with this stanza of Angie's poem. And it can go the other way as well. For an example of the inverse, so weak A lines and normal B lines, here is a stanza from Robert Burns's classic poem To a Mouse. I mean, come on, I couldn't do a workshop on Standard Habby without quoting a little bit of Burns. So here you can see that the end of each A line is an unstressed syllable thy wee bit housey two in ruin, etc. Each A line has nine syllables rather than the usual eight because of that extra unstressed syllable at the end. But the B lines are just classic iambic dimeter, two straight iams. O foggage green, baith snell and keen, four syllables ending in a stressed syllable. Boom. Guys, if all of this weak syllable stuff has you feeling weak, do not worry about it. I just bring it up so that you know all of your options here, and so that when you're reading poems in Standard Habby and you read some that use this variation, you know what the heck is going on. But if you just want to write in Standard Iambic Tetrameter and Dimeter, that is all good. Stick to that and you will be fine. One final note on meter here, so the rhythm of standard habi is quite interesting in that it rolls along at a quick pace until it hits the end of line four. Ti tum 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 ti tum. There's that weird pause at the end of line four because of course that line is shorter than the ones before it, so it breaks our expectations. Then you're briefly back into the former rhythm with the longer line five, but then again at the end of line six, it's that short stop again. So this is something to consider when writing poetry in standard habi. How can you build momentum in those first four lines, and what word, phrase, or idea do you want to pause on at the ends of lines four and six? 
these can be great places for punchlines, which leads me to the final element of standard happy. Let's talk about tone. So technically, you can write a poem in standard habi about anything in any tone. There are no codified rules saying it has to be about a certain thing or bring up certain themes. However, there is a long-standing tradition to use standard habi for poems of social commentary. Many of the most well-known poems in this form use wry satirical humor to poke at those in power. Robert Burns' classic standard habi piece, Holy Willie's Prayer, is a key example here. It is a scathing and very funny takedown of hypocritical church figures who really do not practice what they preach. Another related trend in standard habi is to write odes, which are praise poems, and specifically odes to things that are not usually celebrated. For instance, those three Burns poems I mentioned earlier, addressed to a haggis, and to a mouse, and to a louse. The poets writing in standard habi for this season of Return to Form carried on this tradition of lauding the unexpected. Mark Grist wrote an ode to the film Starship Troopers, and Angie Strachan wrote an elegy, which is effectively an ode to someone who's died, to a tooth fairy named Tina. Both of their pieces are packed with wit and humor, and Marx in particular has some incisive political commentary in there, very much in keeping with the traditions of Burns's day. We're going to take this same approach in our workshop, so we're going to write odes to things that are not normally oded in Standard Habi. So without further ado guys, let's get to writing. Writing in Standard Habi is a lot like writing a poem in Terza Rima or writing a sonnet. You're effectively having to juggle multiple elements, including the rhyme scheme and meter, as you're drafting the work. This can get tricky, particularly if you're new to writing with rhyme schemes and meter, so in this workshop I'm breaking it down into a bunch of small steps. And one final quick note before we start guys, so obviously many of the classic poems in standard habi, like those written by Burns, Semphill, Ramsey, Ferguson, and others, are written in Scots, which is one of the languages of Scotland. If you are a Scots speaker or Scots learner and you want to write your poem today in Scots, fantastic, go for it. But if not, it is completely fine to write your poem in standard habi using English or whatever language you are most comfortable in. Just express yourself using your voice. All right, let's get to it. Our first step here is to pick the subject of our poem, and as I said before, we're going to use the prompt of writing an ode to something that is not normally lauded. So consider, what's something that you appreciate, that you want to celebrate, that isn't usually celebrated? Or at least that isn't usually celebrated through poetry. It could be a film, like Mark Griss did with Starship Troopers. It could be an animal considered a pest, like Robert Burns with To a Louse. It could be an item of food that a lot of people find gross, like Addressed to the Haggis, again with Burns. Tons of options here, it is totally up to you what you choose. For the subject of my example poem for this workshop, Guys, I saw a news article the other day that broke my heart. So you know the Tubbs of Celebrations chocolates? Well, the company that makes them has announced a scheme where people can return their unwanted bounty bars and exchange them for Maltesers. This is because research shows that over half of people in the UK don't like bounties and about 30% throw them away. Bounties are my favorites in the Celebrations tub, and I hate Maltesers, they taste like bombs of chalk. So for my example poem today, I am writing an ode to the seriously underappreciated bounty bar. How could anyone not love you? Big Chocolate isn't paying me for this video or anything, guys, this isn't product placement, but like, I mean, I wouldn't say no to free chocolate. Anyway, your turn now, guys, so take a moment now and choose a subject for your poem, something that you can write an ode to that you think is underappreciated or not normally celebrated. Go for it.
All right, now that you have your subject, it is time to get your ideas flowing by free writing. If you're not familiar with free writing, basically it is stream of consciousness word splurging. You're writing down the first thought that comes into your head without editing yourself. Because we've already chosen the subjects for our poems, here we're going to do a targeted free write specifically about the thing that you're celebrating in your piece. So here I set a timer for five minutes and I free wrote about bounty bars. I started by lamenting how abandoned they are, but then I moved on to describing all of their positive qualities. How they taste, how they melt in your hands. I may have taken some tasty inspiration along the way. In your free write, no matter what your subject is, try to be as descriptive as possible about the subject using all five senses. And as always with free writing guys, do not edit yourself here. We're not writing poetry, you don't even have to be writing full sentences, you could just do bullet points, just get ideas and words down on the page. Your turn guys, so set a timer for five minutes and free write on your subject, focusing on all of its positive qualities. Go for it. Now that you have all of those juicy ideas down on the page, let's winnow them down to the most useful by panning for gold. Again here, if you're not familiar with the concept, panning for gold basically means going through what you've free written and highlighting any words, phrases, or ideas that you think are interesting and that you could potentially use or expand upon in your poem. Then copy all of the material that you've highlighted onto a new page. So when I panned for gold, I found this idea that I really liked of bounties left to get stale through the holidays. I also had a lot of descriptive language about what bounties look and taste like, some negative language about Maltesers, and a absolutely horrific pun. So guys, your turn now to pan for gold. Go through your free right now, highlight anything that you think has merit that you can maybe expand upon in your poem and copy it out onto a new page. Go for it. Great, so soon we're gonna be taking all of that gold that you panned and expanding it by drafting it into material. And what I find really helpful, what I like to do when I'm composing poetry using meter, is to bring in that element at this point, and right after I've panned for gold, to start drafting material in meter. As we've gone over, standard Habi uses an iambic meter and goes between tetrameter and dimeter. So it goes between t-tum, 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 and t-tum, t-tum, with optional weak endings. The very best thing that you can do to prepare to write in meter, particularly if you're not accustomed to it, is to listen to a lot of poems performed aloud in meter and to try performing them aloud yourself. By doing that, you get used to the meter. You get the rhythm stuck in your head and sort of stuck on your tongue, and all of that makes it so much easier to write in it yourself. So for this step, take some time to listen to poems in standard Habi performed aloud. One possible place to start is with Mark Grist and Angie Strachan's performances, linked in the I and in the description. Then try reading their poems aloud yourself, and you might also want to try this with the Burns poems and maybe the Seamus Heaney poem linked in the description below. Do not skip this step, guys. It will make the rest of the workshop so much easier. Go for it. Awesome, guys. So now that you have that meter stuck in your head and hopefully rattling around your mouth, let's get to writing in it. Start a new page here for drafting in meter, then using your panned gold for inspiration, start drafting lines in iambic tetrameter and dimeter. 
I find it really helpful to mark the unstressed syllables with a little u above them and the stressed syllables with a slash. That helps me be able to count them more easily, and it might be a useful practice for you as well. And again, sounding it out is really your friend here, so I would highly suggest speaking these lines aloud as you're composing them, as it makes it much easier to tell what's working in the meter and what isn't. And guys, do not worry about the rhyme scheme or the stanza structure or <laughs> writing complete stanzas at all at this point. All that we are doing just now is getting material down on the page using that panned gold so that we can sculpt it later. All right, your turn. So take as long as you need, at least a healthy 10 minutes here, and draft some lines about your subject in iambic meter, specifically tetrameter and dimeter. Do not worry about writing gorgeous poetry at this point. There is plenty of time to still shape it and edit it yet to come. All that we are doing is getting accustomed to the meter and getting some material down on the page. All right, go for it. Fabulous. So now that we have made all of this raw material in meter, now that we have all of this clay, if you will, it's time to chuck it on the potter's wheel and get sculpting. One of my weirder metaphors this season, what I am trying to say, guys, is that at this point it is time to set up our structure and start molding our material into that structure. To begin doing that, nice and easy step here, we're going to start a new page and set up a map for our poem. On the left, we'll put the line numbers, so there are six lines per stanza, and you'll want to indicate a stanza break between stanzas. I just use a little Z. I'm just setting up the first three stanzas of my map now, but as we've seen, a poem in standard hubby can be as short or as long as you'd like, so you can always extend your key later. Then, on the right-hand side of your page, you'll want to indicate the rhyme and meter scheme. And of course, luckily the rhyme and meter scheme are the same, all the A lines have the same meter, all the B lines have the same meter, so we just need to copy out one key. A, 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 B, A, B. And again guys, each stanza will establish new rhymes, so if you want you could then write C, 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 D, C, D for that next stanza and then continue down the alphabet. I'm just writing A, 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 B, A, B for every stanza, but I am keeping in mind that the A rhyme for one stanza will not be the same as the A rhyme for the previous and next stanzas, same as the B rhyme, but it's up to you. Whatever you'll find easiest to follow, roll with that. All right, guys, so I put that key in the next pause screen for you to copy out. Go ahead now and set up your standard Habi map, at least doing the first three stanzas, but really as many as you want to set up. Go for it. Okay, guys, so we've got our map and we've got a ton of drafted material. It's time to start putting it all together. We'll begin at the top by writing the first stanza, beginning with just the first line, and I'll show you how I wrote mine. So here I went back to the lines that I had already drafted in meter. The first three lines that I had drafted all began with O and were descriptive about bounties. I decided that I wanted to use a version of this line for my first line. This is a common and traditional start for an ode, O oh, blah blah blah. You, of course, do not need to use it, but I decided to here. I smushed together some of those drafted lines and came up with a wondrous, tasty, Moorish treat. I liked that for two reasons. First, because the adjectives make it nice and descriptive, and secondly, because it ends with the word treat, which is a word that's fairly easy to rhyme with. Remember that your A rhyme in every stanza is used four times, so you need to choose an end word for your first line that will rhyme with at least three other words. We're going to work more on that in the next step. Once you've chosen or edited or drafted a new line that you are happy with, with several rhyming end options, copy that line over into the first line of your map. And guys, I'm using Sharpie here so that you can see what I'm writing on screen, but I would highly recommend using a pencil in case you need to make any changes later. 
All right, guys, take some time now. Go through the lines that you've already drafted in meter and either choose one of them as your first line or edit one of them into your first line. Just ensure that this drafted first line ends on a word with plenty of rhyming options. Go for it. Fab, first line down. So now let's spend a bit more time working on the rhyme element of standard happy, and we're going to do that by setting up a rhyme bank. A rhyme bank is basically a page where you can jot down potential rhyming options for your end words that you can rely upon as you're drafting your poem. Here's how I set mine up. So start a new page here and copy over the end word from the first line you drafted. Mine is treat. Then you're going to want to write down as many words as you can think of that rhyme with that word. A helpful trick here is going around the alphabet. So treat rhymes with beat, beat, cleat, delete, elite, feet, feet, etc, etc. Once you've exhausted your noggin, then if you want, you can also check a rhyming dictionary to see if there are any words that you might have missed. And of course, remember guys that it is absolutely fine to include half rhymes here as well. All right, guys, go ahead now and set up your rhyme bank, copy over the ending word for that first line you just drafted, and jot down some rhyming options for it. Go for it. Great, so now that you are armed with plenty of rhyming words that you can potentially use, it's time to continue on drafting the rest of your first stanza. I'll show you now how I worked through mine. So there are five more lines to fill in in this first stanza, and three of them use the A rhyme, which for me is the eat sound. The first thing I did in continuing to draft was to go over my rhyme bank looking for words that would work in the context of my subject, bounty bars, and to work backwards to draft lines ending in these words. I actually realized that somehow I'd managed to leave out the two probably most relevant words, eat and sweet, so I added them in here. I used one of those words for the end of line two, so I drafted the best a mortal man can eat. Then for line three, I decided to really amp up the hyperbole. I've been on a bit of a Greek mythology binge lately, so I wrote ambrosia of the gods complete. Then for line four, it was time for the B rhyme. I needed a line in dimeter, so with two stresses, either four or five syllables, ending in a different rhyming word. It also had to make sense as the end to the idea that I'd started in line three. Ambrosia of the gods complete with what? I figured that later in the poem I would focus on the taste of bounty bars, so here I decided to mention their smell, and I wrote with tempting scent. Then I copied the word scent over to my rhyme bank and tested out some options. Next, for line five, it was back to the longer lines and back to the A rhyme. I went again to the rhyme bank and noticed that I still hadn't used the rhyming word sweet, so I used it here. You lure me in with flavors sweet. To round off with line six, um, although I had plenty of options for words that rhyme with scent, I, well, kind of cheated, and I used the phrase, your heaven scent. It's not really a cheat, but it does use a different spelling of the same word. It's our old friend, the homophone. And with that, my first stanza was drafted. Okay guys, take plenty of time now to draft the rest of your first stanza. Use the rhyme bank and use the material that you've already drafted and place everything that you're writing into the map. This process can be quite fiddly, quite trial and error, so be patient with yourself. Don't put on too much pressure to write amazing poetry. We're just getting down a first draft. You got this. Fantastic, that is your first stanza drafted. From this point, writing the rest of your poem in standard habi is just continuing the pattern you've already begun. So drafting new stanzas, relying on the material you've already written, your rhyme bank, and the structure of your key. 
cue montage of me writing mine. As you can see here, guys, I actually ended up using extra sheets of paper here to test out lines before putting them on my map. I did a lot of crossing out and rewriting, and generally there was a ton of trial and error as I drafted the rest of this poem. Keep in mind as you're drafting that because standard Habby is an open form, you can have as many or as few stanzas as you'd like, so if you get to the end of the key that you've copied out, just keep adding the key to the map whenever you want to add a new stanza. I ended up having five stanzas in mine. Another helpful thing here is that unlike forms like the Villanelle or Terza Rima, where you need to write the poem top to bottom because of the structural requirements, with standard Habby, because the rhyme scheme and meter scheme of each stanza is contained in itself and it doesn't affect the stanzas around it, you can write stanzas in any order and rearrange them later if you want without affecting the overall poem structure. So I actually ended up writing four stanzas and then realizing after I drafted them that I needed another stanza in the place of stanza three. So I wrote that and sort of added squiggly lines all over the place indicating where I wanted things to move. Okay guys, your turn, so it's time to continue what you started and carry on writing stanzas in standard Habby. Give yourself tons of time, use trial and error, get messy here with your drafting, you got this. Awesome guys, so hopefully that went well and hopefully you now have several stanzas of your poem drafted. You may feel that you've reached an ending for your piece or maybe not yet. Whatever stage you're at, let's do this next step together. The great thing about poetry drafting is that you can let your ideas fly, have a creative play, make a chaotic glorious mess. However, this also means that your desk is probably also a chaotic glorious mess, so this is the step where we tidy up a bit by copying out the poem onto a fresh page. This step is particularly helpful if you, like me, drafted your stanzas in a somewhat random order onto your map and now you want to reorder them. So start a fresh page and copy out your poem in the order that you want to use. We still haven't edited here, so do not sweat this too much. We're just getting it so that we have a clean draft to look at. You can keep the line numbers and rhyme scheme code if you want or not, up to you. And at this point, you can also add a title if you wish. So I'm keeping mine simple, Ode to the Bounty Bar. Time to tidy, y'all. So copy out that poem draft onto a fresh page. So when copying out that poem draft, you may have thought, hot damn, that is a nice poem. Or like me, you may have thought, hot darn, that is in need of some work. Not to worry, first drafts are there to be worked on, not to be the final piece of work. In this final step of today's workshop, we're going to edit our pieces in Standard Habby, and a big part of that is reading them aloud. As I've said before, guys, whenever you're writing in meter, you should really be reading your poem aloud as you're composing it to make sure that the meter is working, but this is especially important at the end of the process to check the meter, and also just in terms of the content, to make sure that the poem makes sense. All right, I'll give my first draft a go here. A wondrous Moorish tasty treat, the best a mortal man can eat, ambrosia of the gods complete with tempting scent. You lure me in with flavors sweet, your heaven scent. Your shiny wrapper proudly boasts a smoothly rippled chocolate coat, a velvet shell, a cocoa robe, round treasure pure. A mound of coconuts enclosed, a fluffy core. Each winter when the trees grow bare, excitement shimmers in the air. It's bounty season everywhere. I'm filled with glee. But soon my joy turns to despair as my eyes see. From Christmas Eve through Boxing Day, they leave you to grow stale and gray, alone to wither life away in the big tub 
abandoned to forever stay, forever snubbed. How could they cast to isolation the very best of celebrations? Oh, curse the rest into damnation, they taste like chalk. At these Malteser aberrations, ugh, I bulk. Ugh, might be the best I am I've ever composed in a poem. Some of that was a little clunky, to say the least, so I'm gonna dive back in now for a spot of editing and show you how I do it. One line that sounded immediately awkward to me as I said it was in the big tub, so I'm redrafting that to in lonely tubs, that feels a bit better. I'm also switching the order of the first two lines in that stanza because I think that that'll make it flow better. And I've made a few other simple word swaps and changes. This poem definitely does not feel done to me. It needs a more decisive ending, and I definitely need to work on transitions. So I'll be doing a bit more tinkering later, but that is where we'll leave it for today's workshop. All right, guys, final step of the workshop. Your turn now, so read your poem draft aloud. Use your mouth and your ears to edit. Does anything feel awkward as you're saying it or sound off? If so, change it. I really hope, guys, that reading it aloud went well and that you have now made a start on editing your poem in Standard Happy. From here, just keep reading your draft aloud, keep adding stanzas if you wish, and keep working on the language and the performance until it feels right. Especially if your poem is humorous, performing it out loud at open mics or even just sharing it with friends is a great way of testing out whether your jokes are landing and perfecting your timing. Give yourself lots of chances to share it and really make a habit out of getting your hobby up to a high standard. And with that atrocious punning, that is it for our workshop on Standard Happy. If you wrote along today and you would be comfortable sharing what you wrote, I would absolutely love to read it. You can pop your poem in the comments or share it with us on social media. All of our handles are linked in the description below. And as always, guys, if you have any questions on how to write in Standard Habby, I am more than happy to help. Just ask away in the comments. Do -do -do -do! Guys, this has been the final workshop of this season of Return to Form. In this season, we have covered eight different poetic forms, plus we had the Form Fundamentals mini-series. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey, whether just for today's workshop or for more of them. We have really, really enjoyed putting it together, and we hope that you've enjoyed it too. If you like these workshops, if they are helping you to write, if you would like to see more of this kind of thing, please like this video and let us know in the comments. It really helps. This series may be wrapped, but we're never quiet for long here at I Am Loud, so guys, do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and ring that bell icon so that you get notified of all of our new videos. You can also directly support what we do here and receive so many fantastic perks by signing up to our Patreon for as little as a pound a month. Guys, thank you so much for watching, and as always, happy writing.